A casual stabbing between lovers, a terrible confession at a wedding, and a broken bottle battle. What did it take to tear these old Hollywood romances apart? Although they were America's favorite couple on screen and off, the 20-year marriage of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz was a tempestuous one. Ball and Arnaz fell in love on the set of a movie and were married in 1940. Arnaz enlisted in the Army in the early 40s, but due to existing injuries, he was assigned to Birmingham Hospital where he worked to entertain veterans suffering from PTSD. As described in Warren G. Harris's biography Lucy and Desi, Ball frequently assisted him by raising money for better amenities and hiring young actresses to host bingo nights and dance with the patients. Many of these young actresses that Ball sent to Arnaz ended up having affairs with him. Ball had several affairs of her own before asking for a divorce, but the two reconciled and were married for more than another decade, working on I Love Lucy together. Just before their 19th wedding anniversary in 1959, Arnaz's drinking brought their marriage back to the tipping point. In the midst of a fight at the studio, Arnaz asked for a divorce. At the time, Ball did not respond, but when Arnaz returned home to their Beverly Hills mansion, she was waiting for him. She was furious and screamed insults at him before appearing to pull a gun on him. She pulled the trigger, only to reveal that it was a joke cigarette lighter, a prop from I Love Lucy. Arnaz lit his cigarette on it. That night, he left for good. Although the two remained close friends for the rest of their lives, the marriage was over. Famed baseball player Joe DiMaggio and acting icon Marilyn Monroe were married in January of 1954, and the public couldn't get enough of their relationship. But as early as the honeymoon, cracks were beginning to form in the perfect all-American love story. In mid-February, Monroe entertained the U.S. troops stationed in Korea before joining DiMaggio in Japan. She told her new husband all about the performance, concluding, You never heard such cheering. DiMaggio, a former star player for the New York Yankees, shot back, Yes, I have. DiMaggio urged Monroe to retire and devote all of her time to their relationship. According to Donald Spoto's biography on Monroe, she'd stated, I didn't want to give up my career, and that's what Joe wanted me to do most of all. He wanted me to be the beautiful ex-actress, just like he was the great former ball player. Soon, Monroe was complaining to her friends that DiMaggio was possessive and resented her career. This undercurrent of resentment would come to a head during Monroe's most famous moment, the scene in the seven-year itch when she stands on a subway grate and her skirt billows up into the air. The image would become iconic, but DiMaggio, who was there to watch his wife act, was enraged. He stormed off the set, making his disapproval very obvious to Monroe and all of her co-workers. That night, the two argued in their hotel room where it's believed that the fight turned violent. Soon after, Monroe filed for divorce. In 1951, Tony Curtis, star of films like The Defiant Ones and Some Like It Hot, married one of Alfred Hitchcock's muses, the glamorous Janet Leigh. In Curtis's autobiography, he stated that MGM pressured Lee to break up with him, but she refused every time. Despite this, from the very beginning, Curtis feared that Lee was not committed to their relationship. The two first met at a cocktail party thrown by the studio making Lee's film Jet Pilot. Curtis was immediately taken with her and asked for her number. His jealousy showed up early and in a very strange way. Curtis was able to do an impression of beloved leading man Cary Grant, which he famously employed in Some Like It Hot. As described in a 2013 biography of Janet Lee, Curtis called Lee and pretended he was Grant as a test to see if she would agree to go out with anyone else. Lee wasn't fooled, however, and turned the fake Grant down. Haven't I seen you somewhere before? Not very likely. Curtis would continue to grow more paranoid throughout their relationship. As recounted by a friend in Vanity Fair, when the two first got together, Curtis would frequently park his car across the street from Lee's home, hoping to catch her with another man. After their divorce, Curtis would admit that he was very much in love with Lee at the time, but didn't have any role models for a healthy marriage and wasn't sure how to behave. Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton's whirlwind romance was famously riddled with problems. In Taylor's 1965 memoir, she recalled being put off by first advances on the set of Antony and Cleopatra, where he reportedly asked her, Has anyone ever told you that you're a very pretty girl? For a beauty icon like Elizabeth Taylor, it felt like a backhanded compliment. Soon, however, Taylor was charmed by Burton's apparent vulnerable side when, due to a painful hangover, he got tripped up on his lines. When the two had their first on-screen kiss, they were unwilling to stop, even after the director called cut. Their affair became a notorious thing, fueled by a mutual habit of risky drinking, wild spending, and increasingly brutal fights. The two both admitted to relishing their arguments, even as they became increasingly destructive and violent. On one occasion, Taylor hid in Burton's dressing room, and when she spotted one of his female co-stars coming in, leaped out and chased her away with a broken bottle. The two divorced in 1974, remarried in 1975, and swiftly divorced again. Taylor would later say of the tumultuous relationship, I don't want to be that much in love ever again. Richard Burton was a great actor. And a hunk. 
In 1943, Citizen Kane Artur Orson Welles and glamorous leading lady Rita Hayworth might have been expected to have an enormous wedding befitting Hollywood royalty, but instead the two met during Hayworth's lunch break for a courthouse wedding. This spontaneous and romantic event surprised the press and their fans alike, but the marriage wouldn't last. The two divorced in 1947. As described in Barbara Lemming's biography of Orson Welles, the director was committed to their marriage, but Hayworth still suspected him of being unfaithful. Often, he would return home to find her sobbing and furious with him for imagined infidelities. Her insecurity and jealousy had come from previous relationships, and she was unable to trust him, which took a toll on the marriage and drove a wedge between them. Overwhelmed, Wells pulled away and began having an affair with Judy Garland. On one occasion, he had purchased a massive amount of flowers for Garland, but then had forgotten to give them to her. So when he returned home to Hayworth, his car was full of flowers intended for another woman. The crisis was only avoided because Wells' secretary had the foresight to throw away the card that had come with the flowers, and Hayworth was delighted with the gesture. I can't change this condition of love, but I think I would be better off without it. Laurence Olivier, often called the greatest actor of the 20th century, and Vivian Lee of Gone with the Wind and A Streetcar Named Desire, had a 30-year relationship that was famously turbulent. Lee was suffering from what was then called Manic Depressive Disorder, which was particularly difficult to manage with the kind of treatment that was available in the 40s. According to Stephen Galloway's Truly Madly, Lee was given electroshock therapy and was even advised by a friend to try an exorcism, but was unable to find real help. Olivier didn't know how to help her or even how to be sensitive to what she was going through. Upon hearing about Lee's accidental overdose while attempting to manage her condition, Olivier sent her a letter suggesting that he ironically spank her for her mistake. As her mental health worsened, the couple began having more fights, some of which were physically violent. On one occasion, a fight in their home culminated in Lee getting a painful cut from a bedside table. From that moment forward, Olivier stated that he feared that he or Lee might one day kill the other. In 1960, the two divorced. Later, Olivier wrote to Lee, You did nobly and bravely and beautifully, and I am very oh so sorry, very sorry, that it must have been much hell for you. Pinup girl turned beloved 1940s film star Betty Grable had a secret relationship with jazz icon Harry James, until it became suddenly public when he got into a physical fight with her ex-boyfriend, who had been using his mob ties to attempt to intimidate them. Once the two were married, Grable was ready to give up her Hollywood lifestyle to live a more domestic life. As described in Peter Levinson's Trumpet Blues, Grable adored being a mother and was beginning to feel that family should be her priority. James was unwilling to give up their more luxurious lifestyle. He told Grable, If you quit the movies, you can say goodbye to all this. I don't make nearly enough to keep us in this style. Their marriage, which would go on to be characterized by risky drinking and affairs, would not last. The two divorced in 1965. Film star Ava Gardner wasn't one to be pushed into a relationship she didn't want to be in. When she met legendary crooner Frank Sinatra, she was at the height of her fame, while he was both married and far past the peak of his career. But she would consider him the great love of her life. Before their wedding, Gardner received threats and insults from the public for sparking the end of Sinatra's previous marriage. In November of 1951, the night before the wedding, Gardner would receive an even more unsettling letter. As recounted by Lee Server in his biography on Gardner, while guests were gathering for the wedding, a letter was delivered to the hotel for Gardner from a woman who claimed to be having an affair with Sinatra. The details were highly specific, including his behavior in bed and physical traits a stranger could not have known. Though she suspected spurned admirer Howard Hughes had orchestrated the letter to break up the new couple, Gardner knew that the woman's claims were true and that Sinatra had been unfaithful. She almost called off the wedding, but in the end chose to go through with it anyway. Unsurprisingly, their own marriage would soon be marred by Sinatra's intense jealousy and instability. Are you mad? Yes. Are you glad? <laughs> Heiress Barbara Hutton became one of the most despised figures in the media when she famously had her lavish 18th birthday party at the height of the Great Depression. Leading man Cary Grant was one of the most beloved stars in Hollywood. In 1942, the two were married. As described in Million Dollar Baby by Philip Rensselaer, Hutton had an idealized vision of Hollywood's favorite leading man, and she hoped that being with Grant would solve all of her problems. At the beginning of their marriage, Hutton worked hard to overcome previous destructive patterns in her life, win back the American public through charity, and leave her controversial past behind her. After a year, however, Hutton began throwing wild parties and kept the house alive with guests at all hours. Grant was a famous homebody who preferred a quiet night in. Their differences put a tremendous amount of pressure on the relationship. They separated several times, but their friends knew how much they cared for each other and always tried to get them back together. On one occasion, their friends had invited them to stay at their home to relax and reconcile, only to come into their room early one morning and find Hutton asleep in the bed and Grant sleeping in the bathtub. Despite the way things ended, Hutton would always consider Grant the best of her seven husbands and the great love of her life. 
Lupe Velez was known for playing sexy, wild, chaotic characters in Hollywood throughout the late 1920s and 30s. In real life, she could be even more unpredictable. Surprisingly, her most famous romantic relationship in Hollywood was with calm, quiet leading man Gary Cooper. For three years, Cooper found her irresistible, but her violent temper became dangerous. The fact that he tried to stay calm when she lost control only made her more furious. As described in Connor Floyd's book Lupe Velez and Her Lovers, on one occasion, Cooper arrived at the studio bruised and with deep scratches on his face. He confessed to a friend that it was Velez who had attacked him and that he had slapped her back, which he felt tremendously guilty about. As time went on, the violence escalated. Velez carried a knife with her for protection and on several occasions would unexpectedly attack Cooper with it. Once, while he was cooking, she attacked him suddenly, stabbing him in the arm, a feat she seemed to be proud of. After their breakup in 1931, Velez shot at Cooper as he tried to get onto a train. If you or someone you know is dealing with domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can also find more information, resources, and support at their website.